All right, welcome everybody to our um, May pull up a seat. My name is Shonda Cooper. I'm part of the Tiger Lily family and um, program director for our inclusion and care. Excited to have you all here with us today. Um, uh, we have an incredible, uh, you know, we have an incredible day and incredible month um, speaking. I don't know why I'm like blurring today, but we have an incredible um, topic for you. It was on survivorship. And we are so delighted to have you all here to participate in that. As we continue to um, kick off, please feel free to drop in the chat. Let us know where you're zooming in from. Um, and we will, um, yes, we're going to have this an interactive conversation. And we really would like for you all to interact and be a part of that. So with all that being said, um, I've introduced myself. I'm going to share about the five agreements. This is our agenda for the day. We're going to also, I'm going to share about our reason for pull up the seat. Um, and then we will have a phenomenal presentation from Shelly Fold Nasso, the CEO of National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, um, that, who will be sharing about survivorship and policies around that. Then we will hear from our phenomenal patient experts who are also facilitating this conversation and hearing their stories. And then we'll have, um, depending on the size, we'll either have breakout sessions or we'll have a larger conversation where we'll discuss um, the stories from our experts as well as the conversation that and the points that Shelly is going to be sharing with us. And we'll have a conversation about that. Um, the intention here is to have an interactive conversation and also looking to how we can move forward and looking towards action um, and tangible steps that we can do. Five agreements, how to be in conversation. I ask you to monitor your airtime, uh, speak your truth, speak from your own experience, lead with curiosity and not judgment, and most importantly, please keep this space safe. Our why, why do we do the work that we do here at Tiger Lily? Um, Tiger Lily is founded to help to, it was founded by Mama Carmo 17 years ago. Um, she is a TNBC survivor. And it was, you know, our mission is to educate, advocate, empower, and support young women before, during, and after breast cancer. We envision a future where breast cancer diagnosis doesn't inspire fear, but it ignites hope for a future. Um, we have um, in the picture on our left is one of our dear um, advocates who transitioned, but her mission continues to live on and we continue to support and push forward with her goals too, to help with this educating and advocating. Um, and empowering young women, that is Shantae Randall. So we just hold space for her to and continue to move forward with our angels, those who are physically present and those who are spiritually with us. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of background um, and I will not go through all of this, but to share a little bit about some of the policy work that Tiger Lily we've done here as it relates to um, supporting advocates and what it looks like to go from um, sharing your voice and sharing your story, but also being able to share that in a space at the state federal level and the impact that that can have. Um, in 2009, uh, we helped to co-write, Mama Karma helped to co-write um, the Cancer Education and Awareness Requires Learning Young Act, Early Act, um, we've, and which has been, it was reauthorized in 2020. Um, we've really helped to, you know, we've helped to launch our policy advocacy training session to help to ensure that our angel advocates also are aware and understand how to um, advocate at a political level, at a policy level, to be able to share um, and be able to move change at their within their um, within their locations where they are, even at their national levels, because we do have angels that are global. Um, we launched in 2019. We launched our um, sorry in uh, 2015. We had our first Hill Day, um, where we had different advocates coming from across the country to advocate for change. And um, we are looking forward to having another Hill Day this September that will um, continue that effort, which will be spearheaded by our director for our Heal Center of Excellence, um, Policy Center of Excellence, Lizzie Wittig. Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, Tiger Lily's Foundation's Heal Center of Excellence priority areas, um, we have our, um, there are several of them that we have listed and I'm sure that we will share that in the chat as well if you'd like to see how you can get involved through letter writing and being able to lend your voice. 
um, through this one of these is the Screens Act and TNBC increased funding. This is for triple negative breast cancer and increasing, ensuring that um, this is reauthorized and that we're able to continue to get additional funding for um, screening. Um, increased access to bone health screening, increased access to genetic screening and preventative services, um, increased access to genetic counseling. These are all acts that have been, um, or legislation that has been presented, but it does need voices or it's in the process of being presented that it needs additional voices to be able to push for this. Um, as we discuss, and we're gonna be talking about survivorship here, we know that even though you're, um, the screening, even though the diet, even though you're maybe finished with treatment, there's so many existing or post um, treatment, different challenges and side effects that have come as a result of going through treatment. And so we really want to be able to not only increase access for prevention, but also looking at what can we do moving forward with those who are continuing on the journey of survivorship. Um, Safer Beauty Built Back Package that talks about different beauty products and clean beauty. We know that there are different chemicals that actually can increase your risk um, of getting cancer. So that's a different way too that we're also involved. Through the ICER review, um, they're looking at uh, different ways to, uh, uh, oh, I, they also are talking, looking at different ways um, to ensure that um, different policies and different programs are also being related to uh, cancer and cancer care are being addressed and reviewed publicly. And then extra extravasations reporting is about um, relating to uh, radiation and ensuring that let's say if there was, let's say radiation, the needle um, actually was injected not into the vein, but into a muscle that that is something that is reported and that um, a patient knows and is aware of that. Um, so those are some of the things that we're working on. And last but certainly not least, survivorship care plan um, and a plan for all, which is increasing support and funding for um, survivorship support, uh, care plans. I don't want to go into too much detail because we're going to have a whole conversation and presentation about that. Um, and we are excited to have that in this space. Uh, so our pull up the seat conversation. It says this is a space where we is co-hosted by black patient experts and a medical um, health professional to amplify the voices of historically marginalized communities through candid conversations um, on topics ranging from racism and clinical trials to practices to unequal health care, um, health care treatments at different stages of breast cancer. And our intention is to determine solutions to continue to um, reduce the mortality rate for black women and those who are experiencing other disparities within their communities. We are excited to have with us Shelly Fold Nasso, uh, MPP, who is the CEO of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship here with us. Um, Shelly advocates to transform the cancer care system for everyone touched by cancer. NCCS engages in public policy efforts to improve cancer care and empowers cancer survivors and caregivers to be a voice in public policy debates. Prior to joining NCCS in 2013, um, Shelley led public policy efforts at Susan G. Komen. She is a graduate at Rice of Rice University and the Harvard Kennedy School, and she advocates in honor of her dear friend, Dr. Brent Whitworth, a beloved physician who died of cancer at the age of 43. Shelley, we are so excited to have you here with us. Um, after your presentation, we will I'll also introduce our angel advocates and patient experts who will be sharing their stories. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Shelley. So welcome. Thank you so much, Shonda. And while I get my slides up, I just want to mention I am, I worked with MEMA on the Early Act back in 2009. Um, so I was, I met her then. I worked for Susan G. Komen at the time, as I mentioned. And can you see my slides? Not yes. yet. Okay, sorry. Maybe I did something wrong. Um, and so anyway, I've known Mema for a long time and had the uh, pleasure of working with her. And it's really an honor to be here with you all today. All right, now, can you see them? Yes. Okay, great, wonderful. And I also just wanna mention uh, my colleague, Kara Keenan is on um, today. She is a breast cancer survivor. Uh, she is uh, the communications manager for NCCS and she also runs a nonprofit in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina called Going Beyond the Pink, and she's amazing. She's going to help share some resources as I as I talk, and um, she's an incredible advocate. Uh, we are so delighted that she joined our staff last year. 
So um, our mission is to advocate for quality cancer care for everyone touched by cancer. And we do that in a variety of ways. We empower cancer survivors to advocate for themselves. We have tools on our website and um, a survivorship checklist and other tools to help people become empowered um, to in their own care. But we also train and support cancer survivors to advocate for better care in their communities. We also have Hill Days. Our Hill Day is coming up in um, in June. We have a, a symposium for our cancer policy and advocacy team program. It's a couple of days of educational programming and advocacy skills, and we go to the Hill. And we're going to be talking about the cancer uh, Comprehensive Cancer Survivorship Act, which I'm going to get to in a little bit. Um, and another program we have is also uh, in terms of empowering cancer survivors to advocate is our Elevate Ambassadors. And Daria is on uh, the call today. I know she's a, an angel ambassador with Tiger Lily Foundation. She's also an Elevate Ambassador with NCCS and is doing incredible work in her community in Flint, Michigan. And um, we're just honored to be able to work with incredible uh, advocates like Daria. Uh, we also provide data and resources for healthcare professionals on challenges faced by survivors. We do an annual state of cancer survivorship survey, and I'm going to share a little bit of our, I don't want to go into too much detail because uh, I'd rather focus on the policy issues, but this survey is, I'm sure that the results would not be surprising to all of you who live with cancer um, and have a cancer history, but what it does is allow us to share with healthcare professionals, policymakers, um, some of the challenges that people face because so much of the focus is on treatment and getting people through treatment and research, all of which are incredibly important. But we just need to be continuing to uh, raise, educate people on the fact that cancer is a lifelong problem. If you do complete treatment, it's still with you. You still live with the effects of cancer. And we're not doing enough to help people with that transition to post-treatment care and um, and really to help manage the effects of their cancer that last a lifetime. And so that's part of why we do this survey to try to get data from a representative sample of people with cancer in this country to tell the story of what else is needed to support cancer survivors. And also just wanna say, we think of survivors, we think of someone as a survivor from diagnosis and survivorship but really being more than just post-treatment care, but I think, but we also try to shine a light on the importance of post-treatment care. And then, of course, we advocate at the national level for, level for public policies that address the needs of cancer survivors. As I mentioned, our definition of, uh, we've been around since 1986, and, and when our founders got together, they really, there was really no support at all for cancer survivors. They were, um, they were really just left to their own devices because people were just beginning to live longer after a cancer diagnosis at that time. And they came together and they said that we should, they, they defined a survivor as from the time of diagnosis. And that's really been very commonly accepted, including by the National Cancer Institute. And while we, we totally support people using whatever words to describe their experience makes sense to them, uh, we, do, we do ask a question in our survey if people, what does, do you identify with the term survivor? And it's a very high percentage of people, even two thirds of people currently in treatment consider themselves a survivor. And I love that because I, I don't, some people think, oh, I have to finish treatment to be a survivor. And we think the day you hear that diagnosis, cancer has affected your life. And we consider you a survivor in our advocacy. You use whatever term makes the most sense to you and resonates with you. And the reason why this is so important is the number and age of cancer survivors is just increasing. So we have 18 million now. By 2040, there'll be 26 million. And then the length of survivorship. So 20, almost 20% of survivors have lived 20 years with, with cancer and, and are still experiencing the effects of that cancer. So I mentioned our state of survivorship survey. And um, we uh, this this is the results from the 2022 survey, but the 2023 survey is just launched today, so it's uh, excellent timing. And if Kara hasn't already, she's going to share the link to it, and we would love for you to take the survey um, because it helps us to both direct our work, but also, as I mentioned, sharing with policymakers, with researchers, with clinicians. I am in San Francisco today because I just presented this survey uh, to the SWAG. Um, at, cooperative group uh, that does clinical trials, and I shared this with the Cancer Survivorship Committee. So I'm just looking at the time. I'm just going to give you very high-level findings from last year, and then you can go on our website and see the full report. Um, but what we do is we start with in-depth interviews with cancer patients and survivors. 
this year, 2023, we also added interviews with caregivers and we have a companion caregiver survey this year. So in the past, we focused only on survivors, but now we're going to be adding caregivers. So if you have caregivers in your life who you think would want to take the survey and share their experience, please share the link with them. And then we do, so the, this is our fifth year to do the survey. And we found that uh, the first year we did the survey, we recruited respondents as to, and we had about 10 cancer advocacy organizations that partnered with us to recruit respondents. And it was a, a good sample, but not sufficiently representative of who has cancer in this country. So we work with our survey research provider to recruit a national sample that is representative. So we make sure that you know, that we have um, a representation of all different types of cancer, that about half of the respondents are 65 and older, because that is who has cancer. And, and you know, in this country, about half of cancer or cancer diagnoses are in age 65 and over. And then we make sure that we have a representative by age, gender, race, ethnicity, parts of the country. We also recruit our our and what we call our NCCS connected survey. So those are the patients who the, sur the survivors who hear about the survey from us or from uh, an advocate, another advocacy group. And we do we are able to compare those two. And the biggest takeaway over the last three years of doing these two samples is the the challenges experienced are very similar, but the level of empowerment of the people who are connected to us they may be advocates very involved in advocacy, or they may just happen to follow us on Facebook, but they are more empowered in their own care than the average cancer survivor when we look at the national sample. And my takeaway from that is we uh, we want to continue to empower people. You should be empowered to, to take control of your care, but you should also be able to get good care even if you don't want to be an empowered patient. You shouldn't have to be an empowered patient to get good care. And that's why we have to work on the system to make the system work better for everyone. You shouldn't have to get a PhD in cancer to get good cancer treatment. And so while I, we of course support and applaud all the people who want to be engaged and empowered and do all the research, we are also working to make the system work for everyone. And that's what that's really been the biggest takeaway of having these two samples and why we continue to do that so we can compare the challenges people face. So what just, and I'm just going to go through the high level, but we find that people, uh, the respondents have a pretty high degree of satisfaction with their care, but in the interviews and in some of the qualitative responses, there's a disconnect. They describe problems. They'll rate their care as they're, they're very satisfied with their care, but they'll talk about delays in diagnosis or um, challenges with their healthcare, their healthcare team and getting access to care. And so we kind of tried to dig a little bit deeper here. And what we did was we segmented our respondents into their, their how they responded about their experience. Those who mostly had a positive experience, those who had a mixed experience, and those who had a mostly negative experience. And what may not be surprising is that people of color, younger patients, patients with lower incomes are more likely to be in those mixed and negative segments. And so, and it really affects their entire journey. They are, they are frustrated by um, not feeling respected by their clinicians or not getting the care they need. And so I think it's, while, you know, a lot of people are very happy, we need to not forget that for some people, it's not a good experience and they're, they're not getting the support they need from the healthcare team. And that's why we did that segmentation of our audience. Um, we also asked about the process of getting screened and diagnosed. And what's important here uh, uh, is about 13% reported initial misdiagnosis. Young adults are two and a half times more likely to have a misdiagnosis. Also, young adults more likely to have delays in diagnosis, seeing multiple doctors before they get that diagnosis because they're not always, their concerns are not always taken seriously because they're too young. Um, in terms of treatment, again, people very high satisfaction, but we also asked about trust in the healthcare team, feeling respected feeling like you could share any of your concerns. There were big gaps for people of color for um, in, in some of those trust factors. Again, not surprising to you all, but I just want to share this data with you. And then that negative experience group say things like they feel like they're bullied, ignored, rushed um, in, in terms of their interactions with their healthcare team. When we look at post-treatment care, the satisfaction is significantly lower. It's 10 points lower across the board. And only about 40% say their healthcare team did a good job of transitioning them to 
post-treatment phase. We hear all the time from cancer survivors that the first year after treatment was harder than the treatment themselves itself. And people tend to have pretty low expectations. They really, those visit, those post-treatment visits are, we ask, what did you talk about in those post-treatment visits? And most people talk about, you know, the scans and not about the quality of life and the long-term symptoms that they're dealing with. So it's this disconnect because they're describing these long-term symptoms that continue to plague them after their treatment, but they're not really talking about it in those appointments. And when we ask, what would you like to talk about in those post-treatment visits? They're not, at, they're not saying they want to talk about that. The most are saying they're pretty happy with talking about the scans and making sure, you know, because the focus is so much on making sure the cancer hasn't returned or, uh, and not on the quality of life, the functional mobility, you know, other issues that they're dealing with. So I, this is, I think, important to think about, like, how do we have models of survivorship care that address those needs? And maybe it's okay for those appointments to really just focus on the scans, but how else are we going to make sure that people get the, uh, the care they need on the other aspects of their life that are affected by their cancer diagnosis? And then we ask about the cost of cancer, and we think of that not just the financial cost, but physical and emotional and um, like work related and and um, the the same concerns rise to the top year after year, but they were significantly higher last year in, in not just in the financial but in others. And um, in all of these people, um, young adults, black patients, women, and people living with metastatic cancer are have significantly higher concerns almost across the board. So the the serve and our work with survivors tells us some of the things that we believe survivors need is access to clinicians who have expertise in survivorship care and really can provide whole person care, not just focused on the cancer, but focus on wellness and improving quality of life during and after treatment. And then coordination of care to address the long-term effects of cancer treatment. And access to and coverage for uh, rehabil cancer rehabilitation, visits to specialists and mental health care and end-of-life care and then really kind of a shift from surviving to really thriving. So now I'm gonna talk about a few policy efforts that we are working on and that we are also working on with Tiger Lily in both of these. Uh, the Comprehensive Cancer Survivorship Act is a bill that was introduced in December by Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, who also led the charge on the early act and is, I think, a close personal friend of MEMA. MEMA has um, the Congresswoman's ear and really helps share with her some of the needs of cancer survivors. And so she has been working on this bill for a long time, for probably four or five years we've been working with her. And she wanted to wait till she really felt like it was right to introduce it. And uh, she had bipartisan support in the House with uh, Congressman Mark DeSaulnier and B Brian Fitzpatrick, who's a Republican from Pennsylvania. And in the Senate, Senators Amy Klobuchar and Ben Cardin introduced it. Um, so it was introduced in December, but the way Congress works is every time you have a new session of Congress start, which the new session of Congress started in January, uh, um, all the previous bills that didn't pass are uh, are gone. So you have they have to be if you want to continue working on them, you have to have them reintroduced. So it needs to be reintroduced, and that will hopefully be in June. So right now, there's really no like definitive action you need to take. But once it does get introduced, we'll be letting you know, and Tiger Lily, I'm sure we'll be letting, because I know they've been incredible uh, champions for this legislation, we'll be letting you know about it so that you can contact your members of Congress and ask them to co-sponsor it. So what does it do? Well, one of the things it does is provide uh, Medicare reimbursement for cancer care planning. Cancer care planning is uh, the provision of a plan at, at diagnosis, anytime there's a change in diagnosis, and at that transition to survivorship. So when Shonda was talking about survivorship care plans, that's something that we've cha uh, championed for a long time. And we're grateful to work with Tiger Lily on championing the need for cancer uh, for survivorship care plans. We had worked on and um, will continue to work on a separate bill with Congressman DeSaulnier that would just that was just focused on survivorship care planning or care planning, not just that not just that transition to survivorship, but at diagnosis. Um, but we we're grateful that Congresswoman Washburn Schultz included it in this bill. It also has a lot of other provisions. It really kind of takes a, a holistic view of what survivors need. It's got provisions to help with in, uh, education and resources, both for patients and clinicians. The alternative payment model would help incentivize providers to provide more holistic survivorship care. 
it provides for navigation, this demonstration program that would also provide grants to uh, cancer care, cancer centers to develop survivorship programs. It would provide assistance for employment so that people can maintain their jobs while they're going through cancer treatment. It has a couple of different provisions that would support childhood cancer survivors uh, by making sure that they are continuing the care that they, getting the care that they need uh, because childhood cancer survivors have a lot of challenges. Often they are lost to the system after they, you know, they were treated as a child and then they grow up and they don't have that follow-up care. And then also would provide fertility preservation for Medicaid beneficiaries. So we're big, we're very excited about this. We're big believers in this bill and looking forward to working on it. There's no action now, but there will be very soon. So we want you to, you know, keep, stay tuned. And when the time, when it is introduced, contact your members of Congress and ask them to sign on and support this. And then the other policy issue I just, I wanted to talk about is deep flap construction. So you all probably know a lot about this, but when someone has to have breast reconstruction, their options are flat closure, implants, or uh, reconstruction using their own tissue. And with uh, and that's called autologous reconstruction. And with autologous reconstruction, there's different uh, types of procedures. And one, an older procedure called TRAM uses muscle tissue. And then the deep flap uses tissue that does not, it spares the muscle. So it's much better for patients because it doesn't have the, the long-term effects of using that, of taking muscle tissue, which is really invasive and, and difficult and really can have lifelong effects. So it, it allows for reconstruction without implants using your own tissue. So patients can feel like, feel whole again and have a much better outcomes in terms of um, recovery, lack, uh, less pain medication needed. It's, it's, it's been described to me as deep flap is much better for patients, but much harder for surgeons. It's a really complicated procedure. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to master it. And the other procedures like um, tram flap is, is easier for physicians, but much harder on the patient. And then implants are, are, not, as, are not as challenging as, as deep flap, but deep flap has, you know, the more patients are becoming concerned about issues with implants. They, they have a shelf life. They only last 10, 10 to 12 years and often will have to be replaced. There's additional screening requirements with implants. We think everyone should have the right to, the, to whatever uh, reconstruction option is best for them. But the problem here is with the payment. So it's, it gets really complicated and, and um, weedy in the policy, but the American Medical Association and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, they manage these codes that physicians use to build insurance providers for their services. So that's whether it's a private insurer or Medicare or Medicaid. So going through this process, uh, they CMS announced plans last year to eliminate this S code, which is the code that really, that pays the surgeons extra to do this deep flap construction because it is it sort of recognizes the complexity of that that procedure. And it was meant to be a temporary code, but there's the without the code, there's no there's not adequate payment for it. So CMS did this at the request of insurance companies and going through this AMA process. But the result is now insurance companies, and even though the code is still in existence till the end of 2024, they're already starting to pay surgeons less for this procedure that is really challenging. So as a result, some surgeons are saying they can't do it. The payment is so low in some instances for this uh, without this S code that they really uh, end up losing money on it. Um, and so they're not offering it. So then that's causing an access issue. So patients aren't either aren't offered the option or they have to travel to find a surgeon who will perform it. Or of course they can always pay out of pocket. I mean, surgeons will always allow people to pay out of pocket, but that creates an equity issue because then who can afford that? It's, it's a very expensive procedure. And there's the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act, which was passed in 1998, so 25 years ago, uh, requires coverage of reconstruction. So it is covered, it is just not covered adequately enough to pay surgeons what they would need to, um, to be able to offer this. So one of the surgeons that we've been talking to that, that is really leading the charge on this says, you know, she has to hire somebody to be there in the room with her. And some of the reimbursements 
don't even barely cover, don't even cover that person's, you know, and she, cause it's something she can't do by herself because it's so complicated. She needs a, a co-surgeon there. So as a result, so there's been an incredible amount of advocacy on this issue um, led by one group that's an, a couple of groups that have been working on this a lot, but one is the Community Breast Reconstruction Alliance. And um, they, and that is a group of healthcare providers and patients and patient groups. And if you have had an issue with getting deep flap construction, you can go to their website, um, CBRA's website, and share your story with them. Um, but there's also been a lot of media coverage. Um, there have been stories on PBS and um, in uh, local markets um, that really describe this issue. It is, it's a technical issue. It's not that easy to explain, and I hope I explained it well enough. Um, and then there's also been, um, we, we wrote a letter to CMS and, and had a bunch of groups sign on. We had about 30 uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, 12 professional societies, and about 200 individual healthcare providers who signed that letter. And at the same time, uh, an, uh, another advocacy group, Triage Cancer, organized a petition drive and lots of, uh, all of us sort of helped drive people to sign this petition. We had almost 5,000 signatures. So last month we delivered this petition and letter to CMS and they are reconsidering their decision as a result of all this advocacy. So there's a public meeting on June 1st and you can email your comments to this email address by June 1st to let them know um, about why this is important. I CMS is, they need to hear from patients. They need to understand that while they're, you know, sort of just doing their job of maintaining these codes, there was, I don't think there was an appreciation of what the elimination of this code would mean for patient access. And so they need to hear from patients as to why it's important to have access to this procedure. So whether you've had it or not, if it's something that you know you, you feel is important, you can email your comments to this email address and um, and you can tune into the public meeting on June 1st. Um, they have a, a few sl slots allowed for five minute speakers. I have no idea how they're going to choose those. We've signed up to be one, but I don't know how they're going to do that. Um, and and so we're this was just a great testament to advocacy really making a difference. I don't know if they're going to change their decision, but the fact that they're reconsidering it and putting it um, as an agenda item of this public meeting on June first is a is a huge accomplishment and a step in the right direction. And we're very hopeful that they will um, that they will reverse this decision because access is is really key. There are uh, not a lot of surgeons in this country who do this procedure. It's, I think, uh, only about like 120 um, surgeons around the country who do this. And if a lot of them won't do it because the payment is inadequate, that really creates an access issue for something that is an important option for reconstruction for women. So um, that is all of my comments. And I just really look forward to hearing from the patient experts and then the discussion afterward and any questions you may have. Wow. Thank you so much, Shelly, for that informative presentation. There are so many gems and just um, it was just filled with a lot of uh, information about um, the cancer, the survivorship plan um, that's coming up, um, that act and deep flat reconstruction and also different ways to get involved. I know that there are a lot of different comments going on in the chat already. So I know that we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a really lively conversation um, about this as we continue on. I'm so excited to now introduce um, and welcome our patient experts as well, who will continue to share on their, share their this and speak about um, their journeys as it relates to survivorship. Um, I have we have Neosha Ponder with us, um, Evelyn Alela, uh, Mark Marika Cole, and Janelle uh, Deshadal, who will be sharing their stories. Um, I will just ask that they each you know take about five minutes to talk about. I know trying to put all of that into five minutes, but being able to share about their um, their journey. I'm going to ask Marika. Uh, Cole to start kick us off and then we'll hear from Janelle, Evelyn, and then Neosha. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you, Shanda. Um, I'm Marika Cole. I am um, a stage two invasive ductal carcinoma breast, care, breast cancer survivor. Um, it's been two years now, almost three um, in survivorship. And just like, I believe it was Daria said in the um, comments, you know, our 
journeys that we feel are a little different because we are advocating for ourselves. And I don't know if it's just something in us, you know, when we became patients and we became advocates, but it should not be like that for um, everyone shouldn't have to, you know, have this type of, um, you know, journey in order to get the right cancer care. Um, today, I really just wanted to say um, in my survivorship and, you know, getting into thriving, that one thing I want everyone in, in survivorship to um, think about, talk to your physicians about is heart health. Um, I am a former athlete um, in college. I uh, ran track. So I'm a division one track athlete and probably will always, you know, have that in my mind that I am still an athlete, but, um, after cancer care after, or after cancer going through chemo and radiation, um, the cancer was on my left side. Um, so on my, the side of my heart, um, although there were techniques that I used during, um, during my radiation to like expand the lungs to kind of cover the heart when the beams hit. Um, there's, I, I started to feel like winded and I started to um, just feel different um, more recently. And uh, when I go for my checkups, they were four months and now they're every six months. Um, my physician was like, you know, my oncologist, make sure you get um, echocardiogram, make sure, you know, if you need to get a stress test, like several things to just make sure your heart health is okay. Um, so that's one thing that I just wanted to make sure I brought up. Um, I know in the African-American community as well, heart disease, I mean, for everybody, heart disease is also a number one, um, you know, killer um, to, to, say, to say it frankly. And so I just wanna make sure that in survivorship that you know we're not overlooking um, our heart health, especially with all the treatments that we've gone through. So um, that's my tidbit and um, I'm just so happy to be here. Survivorship, like a lot of people are saying, it can be tough. Um, and I'm so happy that we have the resources here um, that we have. Uh, we want to make sure that we are exercising and working out, but at the same time, if we're starting to feel, you know, a little strange and feeling like, you know, um, I can't catch my breath or my, you know, my heartbeat's feeling funny, you know, don't let that go um, unnoticed. You know, if you notice something, make sure to to speak with your oncologist about it. So um, that's what I, I really wanted to say. I don't want to take, take up too much time, but um, again, happy to be here and and um, let's keep going and pushing everything we can with survivorship. Thank you, Marika. Thank you for sharing that and joining us from the West Coast. I know as we talk to and go through this, um, you know, these different conversations, we have representation from all across the country and globally as well. Um, and being able to touch on your, your survivorship journey. And as you said, moving from survivorship to thrivership, um, in California, how does that look compared to, we're going to hear from Janelle right now, who's in New Orleans, what is her experience and how is that coming, you know, how is that coming along? So um, I'm going to pass it over now to Janelle um, to hear from you, share about your story as well as um, your journey, and then I'll pass it on to Evelyn. So thank you and welcome. Awesome, awesome. Good morning, ladies. Um, my name is Janelle Desatel. I am born and raised here in New Orleans, Louisiana. So yes, it's a little different here and it's getting a little humid outside, but um, uh, I started actually my cancer journey back in December, 2020. I was diagnosed with triple negative invasive ductal carcinoma stage 1A. Um, I did have to undergo 16 rounds of chemotherapy as well as 17 rounds of immunotherapy. Um, a fun fact is that I was on the Keytruda trial during the time of my chemotherapy rounds, and then it actually got FDA approved one week after my bilateral mastectomy. So I feel like I was half guinea pig, half like, oh my gosh, I did it. And I was a part of this journey. So i um, kind of excited about that. So I did undergo um, Keytruda. I did have a double mastectomy along with immediate reconstruction. Um, and what amazes me about all that is going on now with uh, the DF 
conversation. I'm actually scheduled to have one in the next few months. Just due to the fact of me having an immediate reconstruction, it didn't really allow any time to like actually become adjusted to my, my implants basically. So over time, the symmetry of them just kind of started to change and started to shift. And between myself and my plastic surgeon, we both decided that um, we were gonna go ahead and go through with the diet procedure just to provide a little bit more comfort. Cause that's also the case that I've been dealing with as well. Um, just having a discomfort with the the immediate reconstruction so that's something that i always like to share now in my story um because a lot of women are you know oh i want to have you know the look of the boobs immediately it may look good but it's also the feel you know and and the things that we have to go through after so um as far as survivorship is concerned i am so happy to be um a part of this conversation as i know that all of our journeys are different. Um, I personally did not realize that survivorship would be as tough as it is. Um, of course, we all know as soon as we finish chemo, it's like, you know, okay, I can, you know, try to get back to normal life and, you know, try to do what I used to do. And I didn't realize that this is a totally new life that I have to become acclimated to. Um, not realizing that I am going to get more tired than I used to, you know, not realizing that there may be some things that, you know, I may not be able to do anymore. Or, you know, I tried to go back into my independent phase and still realizing that there are some things that I will be dependent on. So um, I'm happy to be a part of this conversation um, along with the mental health aspects. Um, going through cancer, going through the journey, it was, you know, okay, we're going to fight through this. We're going to push through this. But then after the fact, it became like more of an anxiety or um, a, a depression in, you know, I guess missing the person that I used to be. Um, so those are things that I'm currently dealing with. I am, I'm, I wholeheartedly suggest therapy. Um, I love going to my therapy sessions and really just kind of talking through um, the things that I've been feeling um, along with the fatigue. You know, it, it's the, the unexplainable, like, oh my gosh, why am I so tired? And I have to have my friends or my family to remind me like, Janelle, your body is still in recovery. You know, this month I've reached two years out of active chemotherapy, but I'm only like a year and a half out of my immunotherapy stage. So it's like, I'm still healing. So um, I'm happy to be a part of this conversation just to kind of share that side of the story, because there are so many things that we're rooting for, but then there are those other hidden things that we may not talk about as much. Absolutely. Janelle, thank you so much for sharing that and being here and talking about that perspective. Um, from you know the sides to talk about deflap the reconstruction to mental health and the importance of that and like you were saying even though you stopped active treatment you know chemotherapy two years ago but a year and a half out from the immunotherapy just talk about these other sides and I appreciate you for um, creating space and your vulnerability and transparency about some of these things that we don't really talk about so you know I'm really excited for us to dive in to continue that conversation um, as we have like a larger conversation after we hear from everyone um, and I encourage you all to continue to write in the chat about your you know your some of what others that are on are incur are experiencing um, as we discuss this further so just thank you Janelle um, I'm going to pass it over and take us across the Atlantic to um, our sister, Evelyn, in Kenya to share about her survivorship journey, as well as as we talk about from a national, also global perspective, international, what it looks like in Kenya in terms of resources and what is available um, for her survivorship journey. So Evelyn, welcome. Thank you, Shanda. Um, Evelyn Alela from Nairobi, Kenya. Nairobi is called the city in the sun, beautiful weather. You should all try and visit someday. Um, so um, I was diagnosed with a triple negative um, breast cancer, stage 2A, three years ago. Actually, today is three years since I was told I have cancer. So yeah, May 2020, I had the three words that changed my life forever. 
And yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited that I'm moving closer to the five-year mark, which is very significant for triple negative breast cancer. So um, I was diagnosed during COVID. We all know how difficult it was. Um, so I went through um, standard treatment, um, chemo, surgery, and, and radio. And um, so after I finished that, um, I, 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 was, I needed to do genetic testing, which was not really readily available in Kenya. Um, so I did it um, about uh, several months after I finished treatment. And um, as expected, I was uh, positive for the um, BRCA1 mutation. So this meant that I need to do um, DMX. Uh, the first thing I asked my doctor is, why did we just do it the first time I was diagnosed? And she said, um, because um, of your age and we did not know your genetic status, we wouldn't have done it. I, I was 41 um, during um, diagnosis. So I'm planning to do DMX. I have been planning it for a very long time now. I think I have a lot of fear because I know um, it is a heavy surgery in terms of um, you know, the surgery itself and the recovery. So I spent a lot of time um, reading on it and getting other patient testimonies just so that um, when I go for it, I am ready 100% um, for it. So um, survivorship has not been easy for me because um, one, uh, you know, like everybody else, um, I thought that once uh, treatment was over, I would snap right back to um, the person I was, you know, very, very active, physically sharp and running around, um, living my best life, taking care of my family and friends and, and everybody. Um, so I struggle a lot with uh, with fatigue and the most annoying chemo brain. Um, sometimes um, my husband thinks I use it as an excuse because I forget the silliest and simplest of things. Then he tells me three years later, really chemo brain? I, I tell him people have chemo brain even up to seven, 10 years later. So really, um, you know, just uh, cut me some slack. But he's been very, very supportive. So I think that's just the one thing that uh, we kind of struggle with because to be honest, I forget the silliest of things. And um, yeah, um, and another thing that I struggle with is uh, survivor's guilt because I have met um, many other patients and survivors in my journey. And I it really eats me up, for example, when I started the journey with someone and then they get um, a recurrence very, very early. Um, like there's um, a young a young girl, I could call a young girl because she's uh, way younger than I am. She was diagnosed at 24. And, um, you know, like um, Shelley spoke about um, the struggles with diagnosis in younger women. Um, it took a long time before they finally decided to check her for breast cancer and it was progressed to stage three. Um, unfortunately, she, it progressed to her lungs even before she finished her, her primary treatment. So she's not doing well. And that really eats me up um, because, you know, the questions, I can imagine the question she's asking herself, how come mine has come back and other people are doing so well? So that is really something that um, I struggle a lot with. Um, but this journey has taught me to be kind to myself, to give myself a break. Um, I cannot be the superwoman that I used to be. So... Yeah, I, 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 I disconnect when I need to and just um, unwind and reboot and, and, and recharge myself, both uh, mind, body and, and soul. Um, so generally, survivorship landscape in Kenya, the focus is so much on um, the treatment phase. So once um, you're done with treatment, you're more or less on your own. Um, you know, even family and friends, you know, especially once the hair grows back and, you know, it's, you look like your cute old self. Everybody thinks that you're okay. You can, you know, go back to that person you used to be. Um, so if, even with the, um, the doctor visits, I think they are a little bit more casual than they were like um, during treatment and, and, and all that. So um, generally there's not much support with that. And I really rely on organizations like Tiger Lily Foundation. And that is why I'm really, really here because this is like um, the space where I get that, that support and the love that I need um, as a survivor. Um, I've learned so much and I really try as much as possible to educate and spread a lot of love and cheer through my social media channels 
and just to, to show the world um, um, the, the life after cancer from the lens of, of a survivor. I can say I'm thriving now, thanks to Tiger Lily and, um, and all of you. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you so much for sharing that and you know, bringing up some points that there are definitely those who are resonating in the chat with, which is the survivorship, survivor's guilt. Um, you know, and being able to speak about that, the mind, body, and spirit, and also your experiences with what treatment looks like in survivorship in Kenya, and the importance of us being able to have these spaces, to have these conversations, to be in community, to know that you aren't alone wherever you are, and being able to get those resources to understand what's happening, you know, what's, what kind of um, plans are putting in place here so that you can also be able to be an advocate there, and we can continue to advocate as well on your behalf. Um, you know, and as we were talking about in the chat, I know you were speaking, but we are planning and putting it out there into the universe that we could come to Kenya, Tiger Lily to come to Kenya so that we can uh, continue to support you too and see what we can do as well there. So there are several that are like, let's go, let's do it. So um, we are excited to have you as a part of this conversation and a part of our Tiger Lily family. Um, and I'm going to pass it on now, taking us back from the East, back from East Africa, Traveling us back to the nation's capital um, here in DC to Neosha Ponder, who is going to share about her survivorship um, journey and her story. Welcome, Neosha. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm I'm really I'm, I'm I'm kind of humbled to be here and to hear everyone's um, stories and how recent a lot of your um, experiences have been. I was diagnosed um, on the day when doves cried. So I was diagnosed April 21st, 2016, and um, I was 36. I was one year out of my doctoral program at Howard University, had not found a full-time job. And um, I get the, uh, oh, another thing, um, is it Mauricia? I was stage 2B invasive ductal carcinoma in my left breast. And I, um, yeah, his name was Clarence. He's officially Black History. And um, he was 2.8 centimeters. I pretty much, I have really strong faith. So um, that really set me on um, a, a, a good path post-treatment um, due to my faith. But you know, I wrote a whole book called Guys Got Jokes because I thought that it was just going to be boom, 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 and I can get back to my life. And um, God always said, ha ha, but I have something else for you. And it was just always one thing after another, um, you know, from um, homelessness to uh, having, um, you know, losing a parent to losing the one person that did take me in when I was homeless to losing friends who drove me to chemo to losing and I don't mean they're not in my life like we mad at each other right I mean like they passed away and lost my brother and this was all during treatment and I um so I underwent six rounds of chemo and I has I was supposed to have 25 rounds of radiation it's another joke because I didn't make it to 25 I barely made it to 21 I actually should have only made it to 13. So I suffered a severe radiation burn for a whole year and it never healed. So, and, and which now has resulted in ultimately I have two different flaps. I'm very much team deep flap. Um, I have a whole chapter in my book called rolling in the deep because that was a hoot as well. Uh, so you go into the hospital thinking I'm gonna leave with two boobs and I won't have a fupa. And then you leave the hospital with solo dolo but no fupa. So I started to, as a survivor, um, you know, recognizing my, um, the silver lining and, you know, God's little uh, musings throughout my journey. And um, I thought, I, I felt like it was helpful for me to see the blessings and things and it helped my mental. So as you know, you all know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. You know, I am neurodivergent. So being neurodiverse um, and not being on medication or having a therapist during uh, this cancer journey actually kind of helped me uh, not focus too much on one thing 
it helped me focus on many things. So I have adult ADHD that I didn't know I had until I was writing my dissertation. And um, so I was able to manage all of my own care on my own. Um, I didn't have a significant other, a partner, no parents around, um, no biological family. I had church family and friends who became family, but, uh, but they still didn't have that obligation to me in any way. So a lot of things that I did uh, throughout my journey and, um, and even through survivorship, um, I just had to, um, navigate on my own. A lot of times I drove myself to chemo if like my friend, um, she's passed away now, but Tara, if she had meetings because she had her own consulting company. And that was like the beauty of having really successful friends because I couldn't work. And uh, I hadn't found a full-time job. And then my oncologist was like, if, if you can't work, don't. And I understood why, because I don't know if I would have been able to sustain a job as a new employee, right? A lot of people have already been in their jobs for years. So it's a little different. But when I coming right out of uh, graduate school and not having a full-time job. So the one thing I did that helped with my survivorship is I kept teaching. I'm an adjunct professor among many things uh, these days. So I have like four jobs. It's ridiculous, y'all. And um, and I know my manager's probably like, why ain't she in this document working? <laughs> I was like, I got a doctor's appointment. But uh, but yeah, so it's one of those things where I have to, even in this later years, have to navigate survivorship differently in each kind of phase of survivorship. So, you know, uh, I will say 2019, so between 2016 and 2018, I was going through treatment and surgeries and trying to find a place to live. <laughs> Pretty much. I moved like five times. And then um, in 2019, I was trying to get on my feet. So but 2019 actually started me on my community journey. In survivorship, and I, uh, I became a part of. I mean, 2017, I started going to meetings for the Young Survival Coalition here in DC, and um, and then that introduced me to We Can Row DC. So I was the only uh, black woman, black American woman. There was a first gen, I believe, uh, woman who uh, her family's from uh, Africa, but she's much older than me too. So it was funny because I was at the time I was 39, and it's all these like older, upper middle class white women. And they were, they were just so fun. And I learned to row and I row like on the river y'all, just so you know, it's not a, you know, we're not on machines. And, um, and that helped me, you know, open myself up to other organizations, other groups. And then, you know, guys got jokes. So right when I was getting on my feet, the pandemic hit on my birthday, as a matter of fact, like on March 9th, stuff started shut, shutting down and I turned 40. I thought I was really doing something, y'all. I went to LA. It was crazy. Anyway, so as um, as a um, now seven-year survivor um, and in the pandemic and not having a job anyway and praying and all the things, um, God introduced me to someone who then introduced me to a book writing program. And I so the whole year of 2021, I wrote my book. And uh, I am shocked because, again, I'm not medicated. <laughs> I don't have a therapist. <laughs> and I was like, how am I going to focus? But it was a very structured program, so it helped me. And that was therapeutic for me. What I didn't realize in survivorship was, one, the catharsis in some things and its unexpected ways. Um, like, uh, honestly, writing this book was very cathartic because I thought about and felt things I hadn't felt in a really long time and thought about in a long time. Um, and it helped me move past some things, but also uh, I feel like Evelyn just thought all my little points. So I had to like pivot a little bit, but yeah, survivor's guilt. So, um, you know, 2020, I think was the first time that uh, I watched a TV show and someone was diagnosed with breast cancer and I burst into tears. It was just the triggers started coming. Um, and then when, um, when my Howard University family lost um, fellow Bison Chadwick Bozeman, I recorded like a 10 minute video and I'm not really into like trying to be an influencer or get followers on social media. So I think I posted it one time on my Facebook for my friends and family, but uh, it was really hard. I still get emotional over that because it's like, then why am I still here again? Like, you know, I start to wonder what am I supposed to do? Um, I'm still wondering that, by the way. So if y'all know what y'all supposed to do, kudos. Um, but also, I noticed that um, relationships began to shift. So like you all already said, 
you being a being a survivor, um, the further along you get into your survivorship, the less people check on you, the less you know people offer to do things for you, or you know even just spend being community with you, and that is um, really that was really hard when I started losing friends, um, and I don't mean them passing away; they literally stopped talking to me, and I to this day some of them I don't even know why, and um, so there was a lot of shifts in relationships, um, and so now and in going into my seventh year, you know, yes, I kind of miss being in treatment because I miss having people check on me because I live alone. I'm single. I don't have children, don't have pets. Um, and I miss the support. So think trauma started to creep up. And that's when I knew that, you know, once I get a job, I really need to get in therapy because I would be afraid to drive past the neighborhood that my landlord put me out when I was in treatment. And that used to freak me out. And I'm like, why is this freaking me out? This lady, you know, want nothing to do with me. So I just keep driving. But it used to, it was like, it was trauma. And um, so that is something that I think we don't pay enough attention to because we're so busy trying to get boobs and trying to get nipples. I ain't gonna never understand the, the nipple tattoo, y'all. I'm just not, I'm team Barbie. But, uh, but trying to get, you know, all these things and we forget what's going on in, in our minds and in our spirits. And yes, you know, God is with me every step of the way, but I'm still human. And um, and when I was writing my book, I realized that I, I hadn't officially mourned the life that I thought I would have after being in graduate school for seven years. So I did my master's and PhD back to back and I did not expect any of this, right? Just came out of nowhere. And, um, and yeah, I discovered Clarence myself just adjusting my boob in a tank top. And it was very pronounced. So it was one of those, it wasn't like I went for a mammogram. I had one mammogram in my life and it freaked the radiologist out so much that she almost knocked the tech out the way to do my ultrasound. And that was only on one side. And then I had to go back and do all that over again on the other side because she was so startled by what she saw because I was young, I didn't have a family history. I don't know why people think that that's a thing only 15% of survivors have a family history. Like, I don't, I'm never going to understand that one, but, um, but yeah, so I'll digress from there, um, and, um, open up the floor, you know, um, uh, so that way I won't keep taking over, but yeah, wrote a whole book. Guys got jokes. It did not take over you. Thank you for speaking from your heart and thank you yeah. for letting the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you into being vulnerable and opening up in mm -hmm. this space because that's literally what you just did. And it spoke to so many and it's continuing to speak to so many. So I just wanna thank you, um, Neosha, for um, sharing that, for um, talking about what you've, what you've experienced, um, talking about uh, the survivor's guilt, talk, you know, all of these different parts um, and still dealing with that dealing with mind body and spirit and trying to you know navigate all these things at the same time um it's yeah it isn't something that it's a journey and thank you for sharing that and putting it all into writing um into your book um as well as sharing it in this space and being an advocate uh it takes time uh to do all these mm -hmm. things it's it's a healing it's a part this isn't something you know everybody who's on here um it's at there, it takes time to get to a place to be able to speak about it. And mm -hmm. um, I'm thankful for those who have reached that at different times and those who are still in the listening phase and being able to just absorb it. And I think that's something that you talked about too, about which is missing the community that you had. Like Evelyn was like, I have so many vases now that are empty. Somebody sent me some flowers because mm -hmm. it was like an outpouring of the support and then it goes away. And so like, you know, being able to continue to have that community and having that space um, is just so important. So I just wanna um, thank you all for sharing your stories. I know that there are lots of comments and questions in the um, chat. Uh, so I wanna open it up, um, Shelly as well, for if you can come back on and um, Janelle to open it up. And if anyone has questions, I'm going to stop talking, but opening it up if you'd like to raise your hand or drop a question in the chat, um, please do so. So I'm gonna, okay, uh, I see Daria has her hand raised, yep. Hi everybody, um, first of all, I wanna thank Neosha 
Janelle, Marika, and Evelyn for sharing. Um, you struck so many nerves with me personally with your powerful stories and experiences. And I really think that speaks to why this is such an important conversation um, for us to have. Survivorship was not um, a concept for me when I was diagnosed. It was simply, okay, you have breast cancer, no family history, um, was a healthy person, all of the things. And it was simply about tackling the disease and getting the disease out of my body. I didn't think about survivorship. I thought about what my life would be like on the other side, but survivorship in and of itself was just not a concept. And so um, Evelyn spoke to, and, and Jonelle um, spoke to, really all the ladies spoke to the fact that, you know, the, the mental part of it, um, the survivorship guilt, um, and just not knowing who you are anymore and having to mourn or grieve the previous person that you are. That was a struggle for me. And I completely uprooted my life and changed my life to fight cancer. And I am four years into survivorship. And so I think these conversations are important. And I think pushing and moving the needle forward in terms of policy, that is why it is so necessary because the only way that we can get the support we need in survivorship is by affecting change through policy. And so that's why um, the work that um, NCCS and, and Tiger Lily, you guys are doing, um, you know, on, on Capitol Hill to really push these bills forward and to create awareness, because even in how, you know, just um, our, our health care is billed and how doctors bill and how they're paid, all of that is not set up to support the patient. <laughs> mm -hmm. So at the baseline, none of it, it doesn't, even outside of cancer, none of it is set up to really help the patient. And so it's really about reimagining how we approach healthcare. And then on top of that, you get into cancer survivorship and all of the nuances there. So Every little step helps and, and conversations and spaces like this are really what help move the needle forward. And um, again, I never could have imagined being in a space like this when I was diagnosed. So I am eternally grateful and thankful. Um, and I'm just, I'm proud to be here. I love both these organizations very much. They know that. And really, I just wanted to thank the ladies and, and, and express those thoughts. And by the way, congratulations, Daria, on your getting your graduating, getting your degree last weekend. Yay! That was amazing. Yes. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you. It was um, you know, I, I've I've been in a professional and 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 been in a lot of positions all my life, but I had a lot of um uh, remorse and imposter syndrome and never felt like I was working at my level. And so getting my degree is important. I'm getting my master's in public health now because of the advocacy and because I have discovered what my passions are as a result of my diagnosis. But getting my undergraduate degree was really more about just accomplishing something personal. And it had a lot to do with what was going on within. So thank you for acknowledging that. And um, again, thank you, ladies. I'm just happy to be here. Yes, thank you, Daria. This is, I would say, for some reason, just want to say this is what thriving looks like um, through it all for you to be able to go back to school, get your degree, to see you walk across that stage and sharing that video, and to say, you know what, you aren't stopping there. You're going to get your master's in public health. This is this is advocacy. In this is this is what happens through change, you know, and everybody's change is different. That doesn't mean that, yes, you have to, you know, like completely go that same path, but this is something that she's been called to do and to, as a result of her experience and being in the community that she's from, to be able to take that path to continue to be a voice. So thank you, Daria, for that and for continuing to do that in your community and showing the resilience of the Flint community um, and Flint people through your words and actions. And um, I just want to also just, you know, question that came to mind, because I'm getting a little teary eyed is, but I'm curious too, is, you know, Shelly, you asked you like, you know, when it's time for us to share our voices for this, when it's time for us to write these letter writing campaigns or go to speak to our representatives, 
like, what should we be sharing? Like, what should, so, you know, what should we be sharing? Cause I know it's like, we hear, okay, lend your voice, write a letter or go and speak to someone. What do you say when you call or go there in person? Cause you know, we have these survivors on the call, like they're ready to do that. Or they're, they'd like, you know, just what, what does that look like? And those who want to support them who may not have had the same journey, but been all with them in that space. So um, the thing that's really important when you're talking to policymakers is to share your story succinctly. You know, people, everybody has the 10 minute, five, 10 minute, 20 minute version of your story. And there are places for that. But when you're talking to a legislator or you got to do the two minute version or less. And so it takes some planning. And we actually have a worksheet that we share with our advocates and that will be, you know, that helps them t- tell their story in a way that pivots to the policy ask, because you got to marry the story with the data and the policy. And um, you remember, okay, so when you're talking to members of Congress, they work for you, you're their constituent. So they have to listen to you. They don't have to do what you say, but they do have to listen to you. And they, the personal stories matter, um, but it can't just be the story. So it's got to be the anecdote and the policy and the reason. Now with CMS, um, I think they're much less likely to be swayed by personal stories. I, I don't, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be sending them to them. Now, it's not your story about deep flap that's going to change their mind, but if they get thousands of people saying that they couldn't have access that it's the number of stories that they get that might might make a difference they're just more data focused than your legislators your members of congress are are going to listen to the story more that doesn't mean you shouldn't send it but again and and really in the letter to cms you don't have to get into the policy you just say why deep flap is important and access is important and you know if you want to i mean it's really important for young black women as well. And so if you talk about that, I think that's going to be really important. I think that's a really important angle. And we've been talking about disparities and equity in, in our communications with them. Um, so yeah, I think the key is, you know, figuring out a way to share your story in a short, like think of it as a, almost like a tweet or a few tweets. And so the worksheet that we have talks about like, here's what happened and here's, and then, and, but I was lucky because I had the support or maybe you didn't have the support. That's okay too. But if you did, I was lucky. I had the support that helped me get through it, but not everybody does that. And that's why, and then you sort of use that pivot to whatever the policy ask is. And, and it's the same, whether it's, you know, the survivorship legislation or any other piece of legislation, you start with your story and then you pivot to why that matters to the policy to help other people going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly, for that. That's a, lots of great points. I'm just thinking too of, about how we might have to have a separate session, like follow up from this, where you, um, for you all to share that worksheet, and we could even have some practice sessions um, and just of how we can do that and hearing your, hearing your feedback so that we can see how, you know, through our angel advocacy program, we do provide, you know, talk about this training, but being able to then practice or pitch it um, I think that would be an awesome way to be able to amplify and we can also be able to share that as well. So look, yes, excited to um, share that and, and be able to provide that. And I will just say one that. thing really quick on the deep flap letters. Like uh, we purposely didn't share a template because sometimes people do that with advocacy groups. But the fact is like getting, they, they really kind of dismiss it when they get the same letter over and over. So it's more important to just speak from the heart and say what, you know, your story and why it's important than it is to have the exact same language. It okay. used to be the way a lot of people did their advocacy, but it's mm-hmm. it's gotten to where it just gets dismissed by policymakers. So it's not, that's why we didn't put out language to use. Uh-huh. But the ask is, you know, we need to make sure there's access to deep flap. You don't have to get into all the logistics of the codes, but access is really important. And that that's the message from patients that they need to hear. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Shelly. And if um, uh, if you all could share as well, like the worksheet, everyone's so excited about seeing that, being able to provide that. Um, that would be awesome uh, as well. 
Um, I want to open it up again if anyone has any comments or additional questions to um, for Shelly or for the panel and even those on the panel if there's certain areas that you that were touched on that you would like to speak about, please do, because um, I see Marika you mentioned in the chat um, about a shortage of certain chemo drugs and if you want to speak to that as well. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, um, well, I think we're, you know, just mentioning things that um, we need to address with our Congress people. Um, <clears throat> and that was one that I just saw yesterday. Um, and so I know that it makes a difference to have, you know, multiple voices out there. And to get to survivorship, we need these treatments, you know, um, so that we can help these stats. Um you know, of mortality and so forth. So um, if anyone can, you know, also reach out to your, your Congress people about this topic, um, I think that would be awesome. Thank you. And Shelly, is there anything you wanted to add about that? Um, no, other than I just, we know it's an issue and it's mm -hmm. not a real simple solution. So I think for okay. now, letting your members of Congress know you're concerned about it is the way to go. But I think once, um, if if a solution becomes more evident, then it then we can share about like what that is, and there may be a different target for your advocacy than mem than your member of Congress. Right now, they just need to know it's a, an issue, but it's not a simple solution, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I um, just yeah. appreciated the point that Shelley yeah. made about. Mm -hmm. Some of us are advocates, and we know how to speak up and advocate for ourselves, but a lot of people don't. And so I, I knew that my experience was more or less an anomaly, the way that I approached my care. And so the point that Shelly made about it really being the standard of care for everyone and everyone shouldn't have to advocate and fight for optimal care is, is really important. And I just think that when we are speaking to our policymakers, as brief as we can be, we have to drive that point home. Thanks, Daria, um, for that. Uh, I also see Neosha's hand um, is up too. Yeah. You're on mute. It never fails. <laughs> Two things, because um, I was trying to be like really, really quick because <laughs> I never <laughs> ran out of time. So two things. Okay. One, um, also being quick in person, but members of Congress have social media teams and I'm a professor of social media, so I have to plug that. But um, and I mean, I heard the Auntie Maxine actually does her own social media a lot of times, like she will respond to your tweet or something. But um, and, you know, I, I know for sure my member is a member of CBC and, you know, anything that's uh, I know CBC is always looking at, at ways to help, you know, people of color um, and tweeting, you know, even if they're not your member, but just saying we need members of Congress to, you know, look out for this, that's going to be affecting, you know, uh, women getting their breast cancer treatment. So I think tweets um, could help in that regard, um, because their teams will then say, well, all these people keep talking about this breast cancer drug or something. So um, another um, thing that we didn't touch on, and this could be a whole nother political seat, but so a part, another part of survivorship is dating. You know, I've had eight surgeries. Proud of it. And uh, don't mind, you know, I bought one of, uh, 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 is it uh, Faye Noel's uh, dresses from Target? And you can see my scars on my chest and I'm okay with that, you know, but some people when you're dating ain't ready to see all that, you know, and, and thinking about how do you do, how do you date? and and still show up confident right and confidence can be a part of that as well uh shonda for the uh you know but but yeah so i just wanted to put that out there in the universe that uh one nobody has ever been scared of my scars and um and two you know um it i don't i i'm one of those fake it till you make it kind of people and i'm not a fake person but if i have to you know show up with a smile on my face you know even though i know that my burn scars are showing or my or my surgery scars are showing or something you know i just try to smile through it and you know i don't know try to look cute but but yeah so survivorship and dating is it, it looks different and i feel differently about it um these days so yes thank you neosha such a great point definitely one that we you know, maybe that could be like a future February one or Valentine's Day or something, or even just, you know, mm. it's definitely something that we need to discuss, to talk about. So I love that. Thank you for bringing it up too, because this is these are all parts of 
different parts of survivorship that we yeah. need to discuss. Um, Janelle, I see your hands up too. Yes, I do believe that we need like an entire survivorship series because <laughs> there are so many different things um, that, are, that are coming up that we can really just like um, open up the floor. But um, one thing that I actually brought up during our Twitter chat the other day, and I wanted to speak on it here, um, issues in the workplace. Um, once you return back to the workplace after uh, a cancer battle or cancer treatment, I personally, um, I had to resign from my position um, back in December after being with an organization for almost seven years due to like discrimination and due to harassment um, from my cancer, you know, uh, survivorship plan, which was basically needing those additional uh just little tweaks, whether it's, you know, oh, I'm having a fatigue day. Uh, would I be able to work from home or just different things, you know, being asked the, the questions that you really shouldn't be asking on the workplace. Like, why are you always sick? Like, how long are you going to be sick? You know, and so um, I realized that I was going through it and having that survivorship guilt and actually not realizing and understanding like, hey, you know, um, I don't really know how to answer these questions. You know, I wish I could. I wish I could tell you when I'm going to have a tired day. You know, um, it had gotten as far to me being approved to work from home on a Friday or every Friday. But I'm. how do I know that I'm going to have fatigue on that Friday? How do I know that my neuropathy isn't going to flare up on that Friday? You know, it may flare up on a Wednesday. And on in that case, you know, those are things that are being held against me. And so I, I really just had to get myself to a point mentally to where I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I had to remove myself from the situation. But I am so happy and confident now to put my voice out there for those that may be experiencing the same thing um, and really having those conversations about where to go from there, you know? Thank you, Janelle, for sharing that. Um, and um, Shelly, I'm just wanna, I'm curious about um, also with the um, the survivors, the act that the bill that you're trying to put forward too, um, is this something that employee protection or something that it's sort of added included in there or is that something that we might need to have as a separate something separate to talk about this because we are hearing and receiving a lot from um or you know we've been hearing from some of our different um those who are currently on but some of our also our other advocates who have experienced you know discrimination because of being a survivor and not being hired or actually if they put it on their application they aren't hired when um if they do, if well, one person she had been applying for almost a year wasn't able to get a, a job. The one time she removed it, did not put that she was a cancer survivor. That's the job she currently has. Um, mm -hmm. So, is there something that that is that something that we also need to advocate for as we talk about rights and survivorship? Yeah, I mean, it's not part of the legislation. It's yeah. I think almost all of that's really already illegal. It just doesn't mean that it doesn't uh -huh. have. You know, okay. so yeah. um, that is not my area of expertise, but okay. I know the folks at triage cancer really work okay. a lot on that and they may mm -hmm. have more advice on how do you, but I mean, it's like, just because it's illegal doesn't mean people don't do it. And yeah. your recourse is like lawsuits and that's not easy mm -hmm. to do either. Um, so I, I think that's a topic for more discussion. It's definitely not yeah. in this bill, but you yeah. know, I don't know if there needs to be legislative change or what, but that's something I'm very interested in in thinking about. And I'll talk to the, I think the, uh, the folks at Trash Cancer really are experts on insurance, workplace stuff, legal issues, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I see Evelyn and Nicole's hand raised. We're almost at two minutes. So, um, you know, make a, you know, sort of try to make a succinct, um, uh, as well, um, I did want to just plug before you all speak and share to all of the patient, um, all of those advocates and experts. Please put in the chat ways that um, the community can, can keep follow you, whether that's on social media or um, through email, um, so that they can contact you to follow up on these conversations. I also want to say for the international community that we are um, involved with the uh, oh gosh, 
Union for International Cancer Control, um, UICC. So the WHO also, when we look at, we're talking about national and federal, but we have to look globally. There are like the WHO, World Health Organization, puts in different guidelines for breast cancer. That's for the entire world. So we are sort of touching on that. And I'm going to drop a few uh, links in the chat while we hear from Evelyn and then Nicole. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just be quick on my experience with uh, looking for a job after cancer because um, I, I lost my job just when I finished treatment. So I was out of work for one and a half years. So when I went back, um, when I started doing interviews, there was a gap and uh, I, I really struggled with, should I say or should I not? Um, so when the job I currently hold right now, when they asked me, um, what have you been doing for the last one and a half years? And I actually did disclose that um, I had been unwell and I took a break to recover. And um, during this recovery period for one and a half years, I got involved with um, organizations and I did some certificate courses. And um, so I, the one and a half years break, I rebuilt my life and I'm now ready to, to get back into the workforce. I, I'm, I'm fortunate that um, this organization was very understanding and they overlooked that. And when I got the job, finally, um, the HR told me that um, my honesty and my story was, was really moving. And, and that is why they decided to give me the opportunity. And I, I really love what I'm doing. I love where I'm working. And, and, and yeah, so I think it's just a matter of weighing and, and seeing how to communicate it. Because for me, the break um, developed me in, in, in many ways. And um, when they looked at my LinkedIn profile, for example, they would see the engagements that I had during that one and a half period because I would post the things I did with Tiger Lily Foundation and with um, other organizations and the talks that I was doing for, for companies. So, yeah, that is my experience with that. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you so much. Um, and we're just going to hear from Nicole and then I'm just going to wrap it up. And thank you all for holding space. I know if you have to hop and have hard stops, completely understand. Um, so just we'll probably wrap up in five minutes. Um, Nicole, uh, please share. Yeah. Yes. Hi. I'm not going to hopefully take up no more time than I need to. Okay. But I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for um, having this. Um, I, I made May 1st three years um, as far as NED. Um, from triple negative breast cancer stage 2B. And it has been truly a journey. Um, unfortunately, this is, um, I feel like I'm, I'm now trying to understand what survivorship is and what that should look like. And it's sad because it's three years out. And um, the complexities I feel like as a whole, I'm glad everybody shared because Janelle, I think the whole thing with the job, I'm a veterinarian, I cannot perform as I did prior as a veterinarian. I am limited in so many different ways and the complexities of that, the job does not understand. People see you as, oh, okay, you're cancer free. We are not free. There is no cure. And so the manifestations of all the treatments and the side effects and things like that, I think there's no good clear picture of what a survivor looks like into a thriver. Like, what does that really look like? And the aspects of it, um, how it affects every phase of your life, whether relationships, I went through a divorce in the midst of my cancer treatment. I was told that that's not uncommon. That was not really discussed. I don't really hear that being discussed and just the turmoil of grief and mourning, like all of this is a process and the triggers is real. Um, somebody else shared that. Um, there's moments to where it would just set you back in a place where you remember walking down the hall to get your radiation, the chemical burns, no one prepared me for that. They told me I may have a little bit of skin irritation, a little bit of skin irritation. I was burned badly. And how do I manage that? I mean, so now I have all this scar tissue. I have limited range of motion. I have this cording. I have this lymphedema. I have this unexplained tingling in my feelings and they're in my fingers. And they're like, oh, well, your um, neural tests, you know, your nerve study came back fine. It's like, I feel like I, I, at times, like I'm in this tunnel by myself, but sitting here and listening to all these women talk, I feel like, oh my goodness, I am not alone. 
the struggles that I'm having at work and getting them to understand that I need accommodations and having to every three to six months put in accommodations request and have to repeat all the trauma of what I'm going through, those are triggers. It sets you in a bad mental state. It makes you feel inadequate and we shouldn't have to do that. And I do think there needs to be some leg legislation change in regards to that, because I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting emotional thinking about it because it's like, we shouldn't be having these conversations. It should be already on the forefront. It's like, we are finally pushing, trying to push this survivorship, but it should already be, this is, I shouldn't be three years out hearing all of this for the first time. And that's, that's just kind of how I feel. And it's just heartening because when I was diagnosed, I felt like, where is somebody that looks like me? Now I'm hearing 36, 37. I was 40 when I was diagnosed. I was breastfeeding and that's how I found my lump. You know, and so it's just, yeah, I, I pray that this is a continuation. Yes. It needs absolutely. to be, yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Nicole, thank you so much for um, sharing and you are not alone. This is your community. Um, this is why we have these spaces. And if anything, I think what we're receiving from this is we need to have more of these for survivorship and around this also. Um, and being able to channel this as well, that voice into something that is, you know, we can put that towards policy. We can share that with our legislators. We can share that with the congressional level so that we can get coverage so that we know more about this, not just awareness, knowing that you're in community, having that support, but also being able to have that support from the, at the larger level, from your state, from your government, that they're providing that so that it makes it easier for you in this journey. Um, and so I just want to thank you for sharing and opening up we are here and embrace you welcome you and i'm glad that we will be able to support you as well um, and i want to thank our speakers again uh janelle neosha marika evelyn shelly um, all of those survivors those who are um, continuing to speak up learn like share their stories um, not just sharing it but being able to move to action thank you for your vulnerability and creating a safe space for this um, I look forward to us having continued conversations about survivorship. Please stay tuned um, for the um, for action in June next um, next month about how you all can get involved with the survivorship bill. Um, make sure that if you want to be a part of that deep lap conversation um, that is taking place, um, that you follow some of the links that we have in the chat, and we'll be sharing that as well in a follow up information. Get, you know, get on the newsletter list for NCCS so that you can be able to get follow up and know what's going on with survivorship as we continue to work together in collaboration to do this. Share your story, share us with us also those unfortunate pain points so that we can try to see how we can address them and turn them from pain into something beautiful that at least we're able to at least have that access. Um, so I just want to thank you all for holding space. Thank you for all those who are mothers, mother figures, those who um, t are, you know, provide that space to be um, a figure, a mother figure to those in their lives um, as we enter in, in America, which is this week is a Mother's Day. So I just want to thank you all, give you all your flowers because you are deserving of it. Um, and I hope to see you all next time um, for our next pull up the seat. Um, please be well, be safe, be blessed in all things. Uh, thank you again and have a great thank Friday. Thank you. Bye bye.